Welcome to session eight of the book of Genesis, and we come to the sixth day. And this session may well be a little longer than the ones we've done so far because there's so much going on in the sixth day because, among other things, it involves the creation of human beings. And so at stake in how we interpret uh, this section are so many issues uh, that we face in our world today. The relationship of male and female as humans, the relationship of humans to God, the relationship of humans to animals, the relations of humans to the earth, uh, and so much more. Um, so we'll try to be careful to keep this within the cultural context of its time as we've been doing, especially in the idea that this is a counter story to the Babylonian Enuma Elish, which will continue to be manifest here as we'll see, but also with one eye and ear at least to the realities of how misreading this text in accordance with later Christian or other understandings can lead us to a radically different set of relationships with the world around us than what the Genesis authors had in mind. So let's begin as we've been doing looking uh, at the chart that shows us the structure of this uh, section uh, as we've been doing that throughout the whole time. So you can see here on the sixth day, excuse, sorry for that, and the sixth day corresponding to the third day. So on the third day, the land appeared, the dry land appeared, and vegetation appeared, which will now be shown to be food. This will be the first time we're hearing an explicit uh, description of some of what God has created as being intended to nourish other parts of God's creation. It was obviously implied with plants with a seed in it and such because we eat those things, but it had never been specifically named. So we'll see how um, God is not only setting up creatures, including human creatures, but setting up a regime uh, of how to continue uh, within relation to each other. And we'll see, perhaps to our great surprise, depending upon uh, how closely you've read this before, that God's intention was that all creation be vegetarian, that no animals would be predatory, that animals would not eat other animals, and certainly humans would not eat animals. So if you imagine the image of a peaceable kingdom of the lion laying down with the lamb and such, which is so counter to what we've experienced, um, that's based more on the vision that we see after the flood, where the dread of humans is put on animals. But as we'll see, that will be a function of human disobedience, not God's intention in the first place. Um, the original intention was that everything get along under the divinely authorized and inspired rule of humanity over the rest of creation. Uh, and that can be tricky, as we know, so we'll get to that in a few verses. So let's go back to the beginning of our text here, and the Hebrew is going to be very important, so I want to keep that up as much as we can today, um, because translations can be very misleading always, but especially in this section. So, the sixth day, and God said, let the earth bring forth. So this is parallel, as we saw to verse 20, the same exact start here, as the earth is bringing forth vegetation. Now the earth is bringing forth animals of various kinds. And so we could ask why the Genesis authors chose to describe all of animal life in these categories. At one level, we can't know the answer to that, but looking closely, we can see what they did intend to describe, which is a little different than what we hear in most translations. So bring forth living creatures, in that sense, generically, things that are alive, the uh, nefesh haya uh, that we saw earlier and that we'll see again, the, just the very definition of uh, creatures that are alive. Um, and again, according to kind, so celebrate this diversity. But then after every kind, we hear some specifications, cattle, the Hebrew word is behema, um, which doesn't necessarily mean cattle like oxen and cows, although it can. Um, but as many authors have noted, the distinction here is, seems to be between domestic and wild animals. Um, and we could do a whole series on why some animals are domesticated and not, and when that happened, etc. Just for instance, why cows and horses, but not zebras? Why are horses domesticated but not zebras? Uh, and one could ask similar things about many other cattle-like things like elk um, and others that we don't tend to uh, gather for their meat or their milk or, or anything else about them. Um, but we're not going to do that in this series. We're just going to try to focus on the language and I would encourage you, if you're interested, to explore that uh, more and I'd be ha happy to provide sources either in the comments or in response to your inquiries. So domesticated animals, key to settling in in a human situation. Situation. In the ancient world, that did include cows uh, and oxen, uh, as well as camels, as you might know, also goats and other uh, small animals like that. We don't see that dogs are domesticated as pets, although dogs are around. Uh, as many people have written in many ways, um, uh, it, 
evolutionarily, it's probably more like dogs um, domesticated us uh, for their purposes. But again, we don't need to get into that, uh, that issue for now about how the scavenger of the world can look cute so that we take them in um, and make their life pretty darn easy as a domestic dog who tends to have it. But anyway, domestic animals and then creeping things. Creeping uh, is all misleading because it suggests on its face legless things like worms and snakes. Um, the Hebrew here, remes, as you can see, uh, used three times in three verses uh, for things that creep and creeping things here. Um, really simply means small things like insects and bugs and little animals on the land. Um, the things that are according to Leviticus, in terms of purity, not going to be human food uh, for different criteria than the vegetarian animal split we're going to see in this chapter. Um, uh, so they're not for human food, and they're obviously not domesticated animals, but it just refers to the small things that are out there. And of course, in their time, there are a lot more of those than there are in our time. So um, the world would have been crawling with creeping things. And then this is especially misleading, wild animals. I suppose the translators, although I can't exactly ask them, are using wild here to contrast with the implied meaning here of domesticated. But really, this is a generic term um, for simply saying the living of the earth, hyatho erats, just the living of the earth. Um, it doesn't even specify animals as such, although it certainly implies that because the plants have all been made earlier, and we'll see that these animals have been made to eat vegetation. Um, but it doesn't use the word uh, animal there. It just simply says all the living, very widely inclusive, all, all living things of every kind, and it was so. And so, um, as we saw earlier with things that... Um, are, are happening here in relation to God and the existing creation. Here, this is different. In the uh, day three, as we saw, the earth brought forth. God told the earth to bring it forth, and the earth brought forth. But now, it's a little different. Um, God tells uh, the earth to bring forth, uh, but then God made. So these are not just simply hidden in the earth like the plants were and the seeds underground waiting to spring forth out of the fertile soil, um, but brought forth. Um, and, and one might ask at this point, not just about animals, but about life it, itself. Um, yes, the Genesis story was not written against Darwin, because obviously that uh, was much later. But I still face many students, college students, and maybe you have friends or neighbors um, who are suspicious about the Bible um, because they think it doesn't take account of uh, evolution and uh, how things came to be in the order that we know things. Um, but one would ask somebody who's concerned about evolution, and I'm certainly not excluding, I'm certainly including here the sense that evolution is part of how God makes things to be. This is a poem, this is not a factual description, as we said early on. But still, from a purely scientific perspective, how does life begin is a question that science can't answer. Uh, how does inorganic chemistry become organic? How do uh, elements that are simply sitting there, not sitting there obviously, but bouncing around energetically, um, but just simply bouncing off each other or combining electrochemically, become self-reproducing things that we call life. Uh, there's a wonderful radio lab piece on the question of how that might happen, but the reality is we don't know. It's a huge leap. And Genesis is here simply saying the Creator made it happen. Uh, and to my mind, at least, that's as good an answer as any we can get. Um, if you have a better answer, happy to share it. Have you share it. So God made now, again, using the, the we saw earlier of God's direct making, the animals, again, it's no more wild here, it's the same term as there, in reverse order here, but not quite reverse order as we'll see. It, it starts with the end, but then it goes to the cattle and the creeping. So it's inverted and mixed a little bit. It's an unusual pattern. It made all the living of the earth and the domestic animals and everything that creeps and saw that it was good. And one might think it was over there because that's the pattern we've seen, but the sixth day is far from over. And of course, uh, what has to be made still to complete this is us. And every word of this and the structure of it is important. So I'm gonna to try to both go over it reasonably quickly to not take too much of your time, but also not run over details that are so important to our interpretation. So then God said, let us, and of course, this is the first time we're seeing this. We'll see it again here in 322. Um, uh, the sense of God is like one of us here. And for those who are uh, involved in the source uh, perspective, 
This here in verse 22 in chapter 3 is a Yahweh's text, according to traditional understanding, the Garden of Eden stories we'll soon see. And the passage we're on here is a priestly text, so presumably by different authors in different times, and yet they both use the us, which is rare um, here. There are many theoretical explanations, and really not even theoretical. It doesn't even come to the level of theory. In most cases, it's purely speculation. And most of that is either just simply guessing or using data that the authors wouldn't have. For example, uh, you can see on the screen here, Klaus Westermann summarizing the explanations that were prevalent when he wrote his book in the 70s and 80s. The early church thought it was an expression of the Trinity. And they certainly did do that. Westermann is right that the church, early Christian writers, did think of this as the Trinity but certainly the Genesis writers were not thinking that. There was not then, nor is there now, any sense of a multiplicity in God's own essence. Um, a trinity is a much later notion. Um, so the us isn't, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, at least as far as we can understand the Genesis authors thought that. Um, it could be many other things, but the reality is we simply just don't know. And I'm happy to leave it here at this point like we don't know, so that when we see other examples of it later, um, that'll give us a little more data to work with. Um, but there's an us, and obviously the authors were not worried about that. Um, whether that's to the heavenly court or things like that, one could argue. I won't take a lot of time on that one. But let us make, and so the making here is a collective, and note the different uses of words here. Make here, um, nasa from the verb sha, um, contrasted with created here, which is the same created um, bara as bereshit at the very beginning, and uh, we saw it one other time. So make and then create, uh, subtle difference there, but creating is usually the term used for something that's special here, and certainly it is special. So let us first make humankind, and the Hebrew here is Adam, and it's plural, and so that leads to um, all kinds of questions. We'll see when we get to uh, the Garden of Eden story, the um, uh, Midrash, which refers fascinatingly to the idea that this original human was two-sided, two-gendered, male and female, like a Dr. Seuss, or Dr. Seuss, not Dr. Seuss, Dr. Doolittle character. Um, and that will go against the idea that modern feminist interpreters had to argue strand Lucy for that man was created first and woman afterward. But this is generically humankind, and the, and the word Adam at this point does not mean a male human, and we'll see explicitly it doesn't in just a moment. Um, so let us make humankind, this new kind of creature, in our image. Um, and it's also according to our likeness. And one of the questions, as we saw earlier with several other passages, starting with Tohu Vabohu uh, in verse 2, is this a hendiadis? Is image and likeness one thing, or is image one thing and likeness something else? And the way it's connected uh, suggests that they're related, but not one idea. Um, as you can see from my notes here, some have argued down to the distinctions in uh, very small details in Hebrew letters of whether it's supposed to be according to our likeness or in uh, according to our image or in our image. Um, uh, we won't get into those kinds of grammatical details there. Um, this is what we have in almost all translations. That sense of humankind shares in the image and likeness of God. The English words, though, don't convey exactly what the Hebrew convey. They're not wrong here, but they just don't cover the full nuance. So the word for image here is tselem, um, which is used here in this passage and then echoed here in 5.3, um, almost the exact same phrase, where his son is in his likeness, in his image. So recognizing that that image that's passed on to the first humans is then continued to be passed on from parents to children. And then here at the end of the flood story, um, as an expression of why uh, killing humans is something like killing God, and we'll get there eventually. Um, so that's selim, and the original meaning it tends to be something built, like a sculpture, a plastic image, a statue, plastic here, not meaning our sense of plastic like a petroleum product, but plastic and the original meaning of it is something that could be molded or shaped. Um, and, uh, and yet, uh, the word is never used for a concrete visual representation, but only for the pure image that has no concrete form. So even though outside this context, it can mean uh, a statue. In other words, human beings would be an image of God in the same way the Lincoln Monument in uh, Lincoln Memorial in, in uh, Washington, D.C. is a representation of the absent and obviously dead Abraham Lincoln. Um, 
it's not used that way in the Bible. And so uh, here you can see in my note from another author, um, she's suggesting here that Selim can therefore best be rendered sign. Uh, something, you know, something, uh, sign indicates something that is absent in that sense, God, that human being is, humans are put in the world as the visible expression of the invisible God. Um, that's certainly a possibility uh, among others. Um, as Brueggemann points out, highlighting the element uh, that we've been focusing on about the cultural context of Babylon, um, this is seen as the opposite of uh, what we'd see in Enuma Elish. In Enuma Elish, humans are created as an afterthought. Um, they're there to do the dirty work of running a city, that is to say civilization, that's beneath the dignity of a god, whether that's to grow food in the hot um, Mesopotamian desert, uh, before it was a desert, of course, uh, because of doing that too much, but it was still just as hot. Um, so whether it's uh, growing food in the heat uh, or cleaning out the waste products of the city or just doing the stuff that most humans don't want to do, especially elite humans would rather either pay or enslave someone else to do, Enuma Elish has humans made as this afterthought to to take care of the physical needs of the city. Um, Genesis is the, almost the exact opposite. It has humans raised up above every other element of creation, pretty much to the level of a god except. And of course, that will be the tension throughout the Bible and throughout human history, is a, a creature that is aware of itself, can become and choose to be aware of the presence of its creator, and yet is not the creator. Um, somehow like animals are animals and yet not animals. Somehow like God, but not God. That's the fate of humans and Genesis expresses it in this beautiful, powerful poetry here. So that's image and then likeness here. Demuth, um, as the same writer we looked at earlier, um, noted uh, not separate concepts, but a deepening concept. Um, so Demuth here um, has, has the image of being, as it suggests, like something. Um, something that's similar to something else. Um, but wonderfully, curiously, and perhaps frustratingly, it doesn't say what is like humans and like God. And so speculation can run rampant. Early Christians focus on Platonic philosophy, to say early Christian writers, not the ordinary folks on the ground, uh, not surprisingly interpreted this through their Platonic lens as seeing it was a logos, that humans share reason with God, and therefore that fits the Platonic chain of being <clears throat> that puts humans above all the rest of creation uh, because of our free will and our reason. Um, but it doesn't say that here. Plainly, it's not a matter of physical resemblance, um, although God is described in human likeness in many ways, including obviously having a voice and speaking and having an arm. But I'm sure, as all scholars would be nowadays, that uh, those were metaphorical uh, in the sense that the authors didn't think that God literally had hands and a mouth, etc. Um, so uh, you can imply that it's physically, that God is somehow physically like us, but we obviously can't answer that question, and it's certainly not likely given that God is not a creature um, you know, in the world, but the creator of the world who's present in it, not something that's an element of it itself. So, so it's just wonderfully, fascinatingly left wide open, and countless poets have written about this. Um, I'll put in the notes here uh, a book by um, a scholar who's a friend of ours uh, on the Imago Dei, as it's translated um, uh, from the Latin, uh, and what that implies about human life in general. Um, it will also have powerful links to other parts of the Bible, and it will have po a pointer that most Christians are probably not familiar with to the question of Jesus' authority, because it will connect us to the powerful apocalyptic passage of, of Daniel 7, where Daniel's vision shows a series of kings as beasts, as rapacious, terrible beasts with claws and teeth and destroying things, only to be replaced um, by one like a human being um, who is given authority. Which is to say, the Daniel 7 text is echoing Genesis 1. Which is to say, yet again, that for a human being to reign with God's true authority, they must rule as God would rule, not as the beasts, the apocalyptic beasts described in Daniel 7 rule. Um, so um, we'll see how that plays out uh, and the question of Jesus' rule and what it means for Jesus to be a king. Um, and that's expressed here in these next a couple of verbs which have everything to do with the question of power over. So let them, 
collectively. Notice collectively here, not to me or you or to Caesar or to Moses or to Pharaoh, but to humanity collectively. Um, so uh, as we'll see, the, the image of society in Genesis throughout is of holy anarchy. Um, in the sense of following God rather than humans setting up their own order of things of power over each other, that only God truly rules over other humans. But humans collectively are given dominion over the animals. And this term rada for dominion um, uh, tends to be used positively. Certainly kings who claim dominion don't claim I'm a vicious, terrible tyrant. They claim, aren't you lucky to have me as the divine representative to rule over you and provide for you. Um, and certainly throughout the Hebrew Bible, that's the image of God's rule, that God provides for humanity, whether that's, as we're going to see in this very day, by providing food and uh, a good place to live, etc., uh, everything we need. Um, but also by um, practicing justice and requiring humans practicing justice, by enforcing the covenant, um, by allowing the prophets to speak against those who would uh, hurt other humans or hurt God's creation, and to make sure that that dominion included both provision uh, and justice. Um, and so as humans, then we're delegated the authority to provide that for the rest of creation. Um, um, and we'll see another verb before I say a little more about it. We'll see this about subdue here. So we'll come back to that in a second. And it's over all the animal world. So the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the land animals. So the three realms of creation that we saw in the earlier days, um, including the creeping things. It's curious that they're added as two groups of land animals after one group of sea and one group of air animals. But there they are. So to have dominion uh, over all of it. And so then we get to perhaps one of the most important verses of the Bible in connection with verse 26. Uh, and to really hear it, we need to recognize that it's a poem in three lines, which is unusual for biblical poetry. Biblical poetry, as we see in the Psalms, is usually two lines, where the second line echoes the first line, often varying a verb or an adjective in some way, but basically um, creating a poetic pair of lines. Here it's three lines, and so let's look at them very carefully so we can hear the perhaps really surprising outcome uh, when we listen carefully. So the first line is here, and again, nothing new is being said here. This is simply a, a pause for a poetic summary of what we've heard so far. So God created humankind, and again, um, this is Adam here, et ha Adam, made the Adam, um, made humankind in his image. That's line one. Then it's reversed, and in the Hebrew, it's reversed in almost identical way as it is in English, so we don't have to look so much at the Hebrew there. In the image of God, he created them. So the words in exact reverse order in the Hebrew, the main words, God created humankind image, image, God created the God slightly out of order, but you get that there, created them. And then the crowning third line, male and female, he created them. And oops, and we have to we have to look at the Hebrew here to really recognize something important. And that's the terms for male and female. I have it here, so you can see the Hebrew, but I also have it in my notes over here. Zakar un keba, uh, which is to say not man and woman. We're going to see man and woman in the garden story as the Adam uh, looks as given animals to look for a partner, and then finally uh, God will take a piece of the Adam and take it out and show it to the Adam, and suddenly the Adam will see this former piece of itself as an Isha, and itself will become an Ish. So Ish and Isha are the Hebrew words for man and woman, referring specifically to the gendered identity of humans. But male and female as words, both in Hebrew and English, do not apply specifically to humans. In fact, um, as we'll see elsewhere here, like in chapter 7, um, they're keeping all the birds of the air for the, on the uh, ark for the flood as male and female. So all animals, in this sense, come in male and female. Um, of course, just as this chapter is not an argument about Darwin, it's not an argument about uh, gender stability against modern notions of gender fluidity. It's just not an issue that this is addressing. Um, you know, so it doesn't go as far as some of us might like. They were just not focusing on those issues. But it is saying something amazing, that the image of God is male and female, not man and woman. 
really important that we hear this. The image of God is not to say that when you see a, a man, a human man and a human woman together, that makes the image of God. Uh, it's saying that maleness and femaleness are elements of the image of God that are reflected in humanity. So what is maleness and what is femaleness? Obviously, at the most immediate level, that's um, elements of sexual reproduction. Um, but even in English nowadays, we use it to express the, the deeper, most root sense of that. For example, piping uh, or electrical outlets. Now, electrical cords are male if they have the part that goes in and the outlet is female because the part that receives. Similarly with a, with a pipe, the part you screw in, which is I suppose just an accidental coincidence of language there, is the male part and the part that's screwed, so to speak, uh, is the female part. And we use to discuss the very practical reality that sometimes you have to take two separate things and put them together for there to be a flow, whether of water or electricity in the examples I just gave. Uh, but in this sense, the flow is relationship itself. Um, that maleness, we'd like to suggest, represents the element of God and of humankind that puts itself out there, that reaches out into space, into lives, into creation. What we see God doing in this very chapter of making things happen, of bringing things into being, of putting oneself into a place one wasn't before. So when characters enter other people's lives, they're being male in that sense. Um, female is the act of receiving. It's hospitality. It's, um, it's taking something in. It's learning, uh, for that matter, of taking knowledge into yourself as well as relationships. This is not, I want to make very clear, to say that men should therefore act male and that women should therefore act female, exclusive of the other. That all humans, in this sense, are made to be male and female, to penetrate others peacefully. We're not obviously talking about rape here or forcing yourself into somebody's life with strong or violent language. Uh, and female, to receive. Um, so it's not that females are to be hospitable and men are to be warriors, as in the gender stereotype we often see in the misinterpretation in Luke 10 of the Martha and Mary story, uh, as if um, Martha was doing women's work and Mary was doing men's work. Um, yes, in the deformed cultural context, that was true, but that's not what God's intending here. That's, this is not about cultural roles uh, as, as gendered biological beings. It's about the very nature of God that is now reflected in the nature of humankind, to both reach out and to receive. And we'll see that those are key elements of what happens in Genesis, not just literally sexually, which it will be, but for example, in receiving strangers. Will Abraham and Sarah together, not just Sarah, not just Abraham, receive their visitors in chapter 18? What about Lot in chapter 19 in Sodom? And uh, we'll get there eventually. So a lot going on there in uh, verse 27 as an expression of what image and likeness mean in verse 26, uh, as well as implicitly an expression of dominion because it involves both um, having power over but also receiving. So then, not nearly done yet today, uh, and then God blessed them. Uh, we saw the blessing earlier here. It's almost verbatim at 9-1 after the flood, after the revi revised attempt here. We'll be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth um, with the blessing, but it'll be different as we'll see. Bless them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Um, echoing verse 22, so as the fish fill the waters below and the birds fill the sky above, so the animals are commanded to fill the land slash earth and subdue it. So subdue and dominion, we have to consider these two words together here. The word for subdue, kabish, here is only here in Genesis, and it's a strong word. Let's look at a couple of examples of what is subdued so we can see uh, what context the original audience would have heard for this word. So in Joshua, we see it involves uh, subduing the land, which also involves subduing the people in the land by war, as we'd see in the book of Joshua. In 2 Samuel, it has to do with King David, um, subduing nations, which is to say defeating them in war. Um, in Jeremiah, it has to do with the people wrongly um, subduing people into slaves that they were supposed to release, and so according to Jeremiah, God is going to punish them for subduing humans into slavery. Um, so here it's not clearly not to make the animals of the earth or the earth itself a slave to humans. 
its intention, as uh, one of my authors here notes, um, the first creation story reflects the tension between, on the one hand, these primal and eschatological utopias, and on the other hand, the day-to-day -day reality of a threat to human beings from wild animals. Um, and also noting that, as I'll show you in a second, that Job contests whether humans will ever really be successful at doing that. Um, but to recognize in a way that humans now don't, because ironically we've been overly successful at this. Most of us don't walk around being worried about lions and tigers and bears attacking us. So we're more concerned with viruses and other things like that. Um, but we don't have the physical threat of creation coming down on us when we just simply live our daily life, at least those of us in nice, safe, clean cities. And by safe and clean, we mean with very few animals. Um, cities have been so subdued that they become almost like in C.S. Lewis's terrible vision in the space trilogy of making the earth so subdued that it's as smooth as a billiard ball with no life on it altogether. Plainly, God's goal here is to have life be abundant and fill it. So it's not a matter of giving humans authority to crush the very creation that God just made and said was good or to enslave it, but to create it an order to have it work together so the animals live their life and the humans live our life and that things work together in that process that isn't named here but is known elsewhere in the Bible as shalom. That sort of sense of peace and harmony where all the pieces uh, work together. Um, so subdue it and have dominion over them repeated there. And then we come near the end and this is where we, we hear about food. So um, we see here, um, as I have several notes here about the um, the uh, vegetarian goal here. So we won't look at those, let's just look at the text. God's at sea. Now this is the first time God is speaking directly to the creation. Um, we presume this is human, uh, humans are talking to, and uh, of course one could take this intention with the creation story in Genesis 2, where humans seem to be made all over again, but we'll get to that eventually. Um, just to note that for now. God, see, I have given you, and Brueggemann notes that I have given you may not be the best translation that, you know, could be as a performative perfect, which is, I hereby give, as like an official statement, we might hear legal language there, like a contract that's being fulfilled. I give you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, notice the inclusive element there, every seed bearing plant everywhere on the earth, and every tree with seed in it for food. And to every beast, beast is overstated there, it's high again, just every animal, bird, everything that creeps, every green plant. Every green plant. Notice the trees are just for the humans, but every green plant is for the animals. So the animals were all to graze, peacefully grazing, no predation uh, as part of God's original intention. Did the Genesis authors know a world where that existed? Well, of course not. Um, but they presented this as God's intention again in the face of Enumilicious claim that violence is what brings things about. Whether it's the divine violence among themselves or violence against the earth or slavery um, or the violence of forced agriculture uh, making the earth bring forth uh, abundance that it might not uh, be able to sustain over time. We'll get to that when we talk about Jubilee eventually in this program. Uh, from Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 15. Um, but for now, it's simply that they're to eat plants. Everybody would get along uh, on the earth. Um, not so good for the plants, I suppose, uh, if you're concerned about them. But there they are for food for all the animals and all the humans. Um, and uh, everything that God saw was made indeed was very good. The indeed here is uh, just like the C here is hine, which is an uh, exclamation in Hebrew. First time we're seeing is it. sometimes it's translated C, sometimes indeed, sometimes behold, um, but it's a stop short word. Look, notice, pay attention. Um, almost always positively a sense of, wow, look at that. Isn't that great? So indeed it was very good. Um, and notice the very good isn't just about humans, saw everything that God had made. So it's going back and taking the original goods and intensifying. Now that it's all together, now that all the pieces are in place, um, and God can sit back and rest, which is what we're going to see in the next session, God can say it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And now creation is completed. 
Um, it's not a seven day creation, it's a six day creation. And now this longest of my videos is completed as well. And I'm sorry for going extra long this time, but I hope it was worth it because there's so much in these passages. And so in our next session, uh, we'll consider the Sabbath, God's rest. Not so God can go back to work on Monday, but God's rest because creation is complete. Thanks for watching and listening. I'll see you next time.